Eat lead, you floating scoundrel! Oh no! No, 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 no! Oh jeez! This is Receiver, and it's fascinating. And today I'd like to explain why I think so. But before we launch headlong into the cool bits about it, here's the background. Receiver was made by independent US game development company Wolfire Games in 2012 as an entry in the 7 day FPS challenge. As the name implies, the purpose of this challenge was to make a first person shooter in 7 days or less. The result was a bare bones but unconventional shooter in which the player hunts for cassette tapes while fighting killer drones in a bleak urban nightmare scape. And we have the... I dropped it. A few months after release the game received a single major update that added two more guns and a flashlight, among other things. And that's the version I first played. I stumbled across this only later and I'm really glad I did, because it's great, even though it's also kinda shit in a few parts. Receiver is mostly known for the way the player interacts with their gun. Weapon handling in Receiver is a lot more complicated and difficult than in most shooters and is the most important gameplay element around which the rest of the game is structured. I'll get more into that later. For now, all you need to know is that the game has a lot of... Uh, I <laughs> dropped it again. Upon starting the game, the player finds themselves in a drab, grey, dark place. A bit of exploration reveals that the setting is some kind of incredibly tall building, stretching endlessly in two directions. It contains living environments and some sort of industrial looking places all jumbled together without much coherence. It's an inescapable urban hellscape. This hellscape is procedurally generated. If you don't know what that means, I explained it in more detail in my previous video about Symphony. The short gist is that the world you play in here is created by the game as you move around, and the exact composition and level design are different every time you play. Building blocks are randomly stuck together and populated with items and enemies, also at random. This is actually very important for one simple reason. In Receiver, there are no checkpoints or save files, and if you die, all your progress is lost. Permanent death or permadeath in games exists mainly to create tension. The threat of losing progress becomes more and more pronounced as the player advances. Since death comes pretty quickly and easily in Receiver, turning a corner always feels risky, and surviving an encounter brings a strong feeling of relief. Procedural world generation is very common in games that have permadeath mechanics like this. Nobody wants to play through the same encounters from the very start over and over after dying. So procedurally generated worlds are used to change things up every time the game starts over. Contrast this with a game like Dark Souls. Here all encounters are pre-programmed and set in stone. You will die a lot, but this will always send you back to the previous bonfire. This means that every encounter has to be tackled over and over until you make it through successfully, which usually requires mastering either the encounter or the game's combat mechanics. In Dark Souls, every problem can eventually be overcome with persistence, and you can try as many times as you need to get the hang of it. And this is true in most games that have combat and checkpoints. This kind of dynamic runs counter to the tension permadeath games wish to create. If the game is predictable like this, its atmosphere changes as the player gets increasingly familiar with where all the enemies are, what they can do and which strategies are effective against them. Now procedurally generated worlds keep this familiarity to a minimum. The player can still master the mechanics and understand the various enemy types, but most combat encounters will be unique and the player can never tell beforehand what kind of problems they will encounter next. This keeps tension high. The procedurally generated world in Receiver also ensures that the player rarely has to backtrack. The items that are required to progress through the game are randomly generated within the world, and missing them is not a big deal. 
as there will always be more items ahead. The only reason to backtrack in receiver is running out of ammunition. Sometimes the player will have fired all their bullets and find themselves unable to progress through the next block. In this case, searching previous blocks for more ammunition is required. So in general, playing receiver goes like this. You find out which gun you got, you check your ammo, you get your gun to work, you pick a direction to go in and go that way, collecting ammunition and tapes and fighting automatic weapons as you encounter them. Oh shit, right, the tapes. I better explain what's up with those. Every now and again the game will spawn cassette tapes in a level. Audio cassettes. Actually, I just realized that some younger viewers might not even know these things, seeing how they were mostly a thing in the 80s and we only used them in the 90s because we wanted to listen to music in the car. Hang on, let me see if I can find my old tapes. Alright, I found some of my old cassettes. Um, look, this is what they looked like. Uh, I also found my old Walkman. Oh, shit. I just... Okay, I just... I wonder if I left battery in this one. Right, here we are. Um, I put down some some plastic bag stuff and I got myself a glove because you should never open one of these things without a glove after all this time. Uh, shit. I did in fact leave a battery in this. Yeah, I don't know if that shows up on film. It's my shitty lighting, but it's definitely corroded in there. I'm gonna have to clean that out. Okay, let's get this fucking... Yeah. And there's a second one in there. Am I ever gonna get that out? Yes, I am. <laughs> That's actually easier than I expected. Ugh. I'm just gonna clean that out. Yeah, I just cleaned a whole bunch of that crystalline white shit out of there. I really hope I got it all out. Uh, it's, it's quite a lot. Look at this huge chunk right here. Now we can check out if this thing still works. Ugh, don't want to fuck up my skin. Well, that's a good sign. Next thing we'll need is, of course, a cassette. Proper camera setup or something. Okay, let's see. How does this work again? I think this way. Yep. Okay. Oh, it's not, it's not turning. Well, I think this thing is broken. Okay, so this is what we're actually here for. This is a cassette tape. Pretty nifty thing, really. Only it was total pain in the ass to use. Heavy duty ultra stabilized. These things hold up a lot better than the fucking Walkman does. Well, that sure was a waste of time. Okay, receiver. Right. You find cassette tapes. There are 11 different ones, and as soon as you find all 11 of them, you win the game. Also, I've been told. Full disclosure, I never managed it. This game's kinda hard. So let's talk threats. Since receiver is a shooter, it needs things to shoot at, like enemies. Here this role is filled by robotic weapons that are trying to kill you. There are two types of them. First, there are machine gun turrets that spin around looking for targets. About half a second after seeing you, they start spraying bullets at you. One hit and you're dead. 
They're not 100% accurate, so sometimes, even after they started shooting, you'll be able to make it to cover. But it's best not to rely on that. Then there are the drones. Ugh. Drones just sort of hang out in the air until they spot you, and then they just freaking come right at you with a terrible buzzing sound trying to ram and electrocute you to death. They're infinitely worse than turrets for the simple reason that sometimes they hover in places that are hard to see and ambush you. They also like flying into walls and doorways after you dodge them, and then they just kinda stay there, right next to the doorway, where you can't shoot them, and when you walk through chances are you'll get your ass fried immediately. They're also super stressful to fight. As soon as they see you, you're on a very short time limit to take them out or you're done. Both enemy types share a few commonalities. They're very predictable. Turrets just stand around and spin and drones hover in place until they find a target. When they lose sight of you, they quickly forget you ever existed and go back to spinning or hovering in place. This is not a bad thing, as tactical play isn't the point of the game anyway. Handling your gun and conserving your resources is. Predictable enemies serve this purpose well. Both enemy types are also made up of different parts, some of which can be shot for different results. In fact, if you want to take out an enemy, just hitting them isn't enough. You need to hit one of their vulnerable parts. For instance, if you manage to hit the battery, they will stop working completely, and hitting the drone's motor will make it unable to fly, but still absolutely able to kill you if you get too close. Both drones and turrets also have one big visual sensor, which shines a light wherever they look. This is used to telegraph their presence to the player and explain their current status. If the light shines directly at you, you're in danger. The light changes based on what state the enemy is in. Blue means it's looking for a target, yellow means it has found a target, and red means it is attacking the target. If you're good or lucky, you can also shoot their cameras to blind them. This will make them completely unable to attack you. Now in most shooters, these enemies wouldn't scare anybody. You just point your gun and shoot them before they shoot you, right? They're laughable. Well, it's not that simple, because your gun is... If I load this... Ugh, stop dropping them. The enemies exist simply to make handling your gun, complicated as it may be, a necessity. And they do that well enough. As previously established, Receiver is a first-person shooter, but it famously dispenses with a lot of comforts common in FPS games. Traditionally, FPS games make weapon handling so simple that most actions involving it require little thought. The most you usually have to deal with is reloading your gun when necessary, and even then it's a single button press and waiting a moment and you're ready to go. In those games, the emphasis is on empowering the player. For this purpose, the player is given a player avatar that is clearly practiced in handling their weapon to the point that readying, racing and maintaining their weapon is a non-issue. The player avatar handles all the skills that handling a weapon requires, except for aiming and pulling the trigger. This is because that's the part that players are usually interested in, their skill in shooting things. Receiver, however, requires the player to actually do some of these things themselves. The player needs to juggle magazines, fill them up with bullets, choose which magazine to put in their gun, check if there's a round in the chamber when they need it, ensure the safety's off, etc. Even more, when you find ammunition, you rarely find entire clips, but rather just lose rounds, which you then need to manually push into the magazine. Essentially, Receiver puts the player in the shoes of an avatar who doesn't necessarily know how guns work. A new player, especially one who has never handled a firearm in their life, will be standing there with this killing tool in their hand and be at a loss at how to proceed. The first play of Receiver is likely to mostly involve the player fiddling with their gun and messing up its operation a bunch. Now, a common question at this point is the following. Um, why the fuck would I play this if I can play a shooter that doesn't make me deal with this shit? And that's a good question. But there's also a good answer. What Receiver adds by removing comforts and simplifications coming to the shooter genre is tension. Receiver is incredibly tense and suspenseful to play. 
This is remarkable because as we've seen, the enemies aren't all that threatening by shooter standards. Fighting them would get boring pretty fast in any other shooter, but in receiver, every encounter is a tense, dangerous endeavor, because you need to concentrate on more than just aiming and shooting. Any mistake you make handling your gun can kill you. This feeling of disempowerment may feel familiar if you've ever played a good horror game. And speaking of horror games... Taking things away to disempower the player is not a novel concept. The horror game genre has depended on it for a very long time. Resident Evil 4 doesn't restrict you to standing still while aiming your gun just because. The restriction exists to force the player to choose between running and fighting and choosing frequently. Choosing wrong has consequences. The game would be a lot less scary if you could just run and gun and take out all your enemies easily. Similarly, Amnesia The Dark Descent doesn't give the player any weapons at all, because being defenseless against the horrors stalking you makes them scarier. Receiver uses a similar technique to bring tension into the game. Your weapons are unreliable and only expert handling of them can save you from being electrocuted or shot. Because of this, the game has a lot in common with survival horror games. Lots of tension, clunky nail-biting combat and pressure to use your resources efficiently are certainly staples of the genre. The game has pretty elaborate bullet physics. Most shooters don't really bother with it and instead use hit scan. Hit scan is a technique to evaluate whether a shot hit a target without a lot of expensive calculations. The game simply checks where the gun is pointed when it is fired and calculates the closest thing in the bullet's path. It then declares that thing hit and triggers whatever being hit by a bullet does to the object. For the purpose of hit scan, bullets don't exist within the game context. Instead, whatever the gun is pointed at just gets shot immediately when the trigger is pulled, as if the bullet always flew straight forward at infinite speed. Receiver instead opts for simulated bullets. When a gun is fired, a bullet object is created and thrown forward at high velocity. Bullets in receiver react to gravity and can ricochet off walls. It makes sense that bullet physics are so elaborate in this game as simulating guns as realistically as possible was the core design decision, but ultimately the player usually doesn't notice much of a difference. I also want to talk about the music. Receiver has a dynamic soundtrack. The background music is always the same, but it shifts in intensity as you play. The game calculates a danger level, mostly based on your position relative to active enemies, and then adds or removes different tracks to the music. Here, check it out. This is actually really helpful as it gives the player a good understanding of how careful they need to be at a given time. So when there's really nothing dangerous around, you can take a moment to just look around and search for items as a breather. There is also an audio track that is only added while you're listening to a tape and special audio cues when you die or when you win the game. I'm just a total sucker for this sort of thing. Love it. Your crude world is not the true reality. Your physical body here is the shadow cast by your transcendent mind. We call this higher plane Reality A, and your world of shadows Reality B.
Saying that Receiver has a story is not entirely accurate. The things you do in the game don't really form a narrative. Nothing really changes as you make your way through the environment shooting drones and collecting tapes. However, every tape has a voice recording on it that is immediately played back to you when you find it. Listening to these tapes attentively reveals a background story and gives the game a narrative context. The gist of it all is that the reality we're all familiar with is, as the voice on the tape puts it, a world of shadows. Human minds exist on a higher reality, reality A, and they cast shadows into reality B. These shadows are our bodies. Human minds are asleep in reality A and completely unaware of it. Reality A also houses two different factions of entities. One is never named and is responsible for the tapes. They find humans who can hear them, so-called receivers, and send them instructions via mind tech in order to help them achieve an awake state, that is, being awake in both realities. Humans also have the special potential to understand reality in ways nobody else can once this state is achieved, but nobody has done it yet. The other faction, referred to as the threat, are scared by this potential and are working to destroy humankind. To do this, they have developed mind tech that weakens human subconscious defenses through poisonous media that feeds them a steady stream of damaging ideas. Afterwards, they implemented a special mind tech called the Mind Kill, which exploited this weakened state to kill all humans. Receivers, however, are immune to the mind kill due to the benefactor faction teaching the mind tech to undo the media damage. Most humans have now been wiped out, and you're one of the few who are left. The tapes can teach you mind tech and finding them all will give you the minimum teachings you need to eventually reach an awake state. The threat have created the mind tech called the dreaming to figure out how reality B works and what weapons they can use there and have then started dreaming automatic weapons into Reality B to impede the receivers. Now, all this is pretty out there, right? I, I gotta say, it's ominous, it's intriguing, exciting even. I really like listening to the tapes as they put these concepts and words that are very concise, but still really evocative as well. I recommend listening to them all if you get the chance. The bizarre urban nightmare scape of Receiver makes sense as soon as you have heard a few tapes. There's nobody there because most human minds are dead. Reality B is falling apart as a result of the mind kill. And all that's left is you, your weapon, your Walkman, and 11 tapes prepared by other receivers ahead of the mind kill. It's metaphysical, apocalyptic, and dark, with high stakes and dire consequences looming over you. Absolutely lovely. But it's also full of logical holes. You can nitpick the ever-living hell out of this background lore. And in fact, I'll give an example just for fun. For example, the way the media have corroded human minds is weird. The way the dreaming works suggests that the threat have a very limited understanding of reality B. So if the best they can do for weapons are these relatively simple, stupid drone things, how come they have the knowledge to manipulate the media into a tool that can actually poison the human subconscious without anybody noticing? That must have happened in Reality B, because I doubt that the concept of media as we understand it even exists in Reality A. This and more inconsistencies in the background law might break your willing suspension of disbelief, which is obviously a bit of a problem. But beyond that, these sorts of nitpicks are just that. Nitpicks. And they don't really detract from the strong atmosphere the tapes are able to build, and the message they convey. My personal reading of the game is that it's all about the power of the media. In Receiver, the media feeding people certain ideas can actually damage them, change their worldview and condition them for exploitation. While other media can use this conditioning to undo that damage and teach actually helpful, beneficial skills. It's a media war fought in our world from a higher plane of existence. And media not only has the power to shape worldviews, but to actually shape reality. It might be because I'm a huge lefty, but the message appears to be that the media have power over people and how they see and interact with the world. And using this power responsibly is highly important.
So how does it all come together? Honestly, it's a mixed bag. The weapon handling is actually pretty fun once you get used to it, and it feels really good when you finally practice it enough to do complex tasks quickly and efficiently. Combat is tense and sometimes even nerve-wracking. It can also get pretty frustrating though. Hitting weak points is often quite difficult, and wasting half a magazine on a single turret is just not a good feeling. Perhaps making the weak points a tad easier to hit would have been good. There's also a minor issue of the background lore not meshing too well with the gameplay. In the lore, the most important weapon in this conflict is mind tech, and you are using your weapon to defend yourself in service to the goal of learning mind tech and freeing yourself from reality B. In the gameplay, however, the act of learning mind tech, or rather collecting the tapes that can teach you mind tech, is in service of you using your gun. The gun is paramount in the gameplay, the core and center to the design of the entire game, and the tapes merely exist to give you a reason to explore and run into enemies to shoot at. This is a bit of a strain on the game's design concept, but it's still minor in my book. Given that they had seven days to make all these mechanics, create the assets and put in the story, it's actually surprising how nicely it fits together, even though it's not perfect. The real problems of the game lie in the procedural generation. The algorithm does not take enough care to ensure that you have a decent chance at success. Since most things are completely random, the difficulty of a given playthrough depends mostly on luck and can change drastically at any moment. Once the game started me off with a single round in my gun and no extra ammunition to be found anywhere. Sometimes the game will spawn you right next to a drone. The spawn points for enemies in general have a tendency to be incredibly unfair. In general, I have to say that while I really love many of the ideas that went into it and even the execution of the core mechanics, overall, Receiver is not a lot of fun to play for very long. The environments get samey, the frustration at getting killed mounts, the lack of variety in enemy types makes encounters stale. In the end, Receiver is a cool little game that lacks polish. As an entry in a 7 day game design challenge, it's a triumph. As a proof of concept, it's exciting. As a game, it's alright. I think it's really interesting how one game can be so many different things of such different quality at once. Context always matters. So, as we just covered, receiver's quality really depends on the context in which you're looking at it. It's not a great video game, but an amazing 7-day video game. Its story is full of holes, but it's very intriguing and exciting. This context-sensitive quality is a bit of a problem for receiver, because if you want to play it, you have to get it first. And one way of doing that is paying 5 bucks for it. Five bucks isn't exactly a fortune, and I personally think that a fun little experiment like this is absolutely worth that price. However, I can also understand people who expect more out of a game purchase. This is also why I can't wholeheartedly recommend buying it. Whether you should or not really depends on whether you're willing to pay five bucks for an experimental game. Fortunately, there's an alternative. If you go to the receiver website, you can find a link to a git repository containing all the source code and assets the game uses. If you download that and install Unity 4 on your computer, you can not only build the game from source for yourself and play it for free, you can also mod it any way you like. Even better, if you look for Receiver on the Wolfire Games forum, you can find mods other people have made. I'll put a link to Josh707's additional weapons mod into the description. It adds new guns which are fun to use, like for example a shotgun and a tommy gun. So if you know how to follow tutorials, you can teach yourself how to build a game in Unity and play an improved version of Receiver for free. If you also know JavaScript, you can do what I did and completely ruin the tension of the game by adding bullet time to it. Man, I kinda 
kind of hate to admit it, but playing this way is so much more fun for me. And I still die all the time. Damn it. Well, that's all I have to say about receiver right now. But it wouldn't feel right not to stress this here, so I will. If you build receiver for yourself and play it for free, you should consider kicking some money over to Wolfire Games. You can buy receiver from the official website or on Humble Bundle or Steam. They also recently released a game called Overgrowth and if you like that one and decide to buy it, you'll get Receiver at no added cost too. I can't vouch for Overgrowth though, so read up on that before making that decision. Whew, that went on for a bit, didn't it? I just wanted to make a quick video about a game I really like. But actually playing Receiver again gave me a lot more to talk about than I thought it would and here we are. If you stuck around until the very end, I hope it didn't drag too much. Please let me know in the comments if you have any suggestions for improving future videos. Also absolutely let me know if something I said or did was in poor taste or ignorant or if I made any other mistakes. Thanks for watching and have a nice day.